This adorable creature was almost hunted to extinction, completely wiped out. But now they're back, thanks to one of the most ambitious and successful conservation projects ever. The sea otter, once a common sight in British Columbia, Canada, was hunted ruthlessly for its lush fur in the 18th and 19th centuries. By 1911, only a few thousand remained worldwide. The last sea otter in Canada was spotted in 1929. But in the late 1960s, a daring plan was launched to bring them back to British Columbia's coast. The result has been an ecological transformation as dramatic as the otter's initial disappearance. And as a result, kelp forests are regrowing and life is returning to the seas. But the revival of the sea otter has not come without substantial challenges as well, especially for the indigenous communities who have called this coast home for millennia. The very creature being celebrated as a conservation miracle is seen by many as a threat to their way of life. Stay tuned as we explore the amazing success of this long-term conservation story, the part you can play in sea otter conservation, and later on, also the complex challenges associated with generations of traditional food systems that have been abruptly altered. For thousands of years, sea otters were a common sight from Mexico to Japan, with a global population of up to 300,000. But in the 17 and 1800s, the demand for their luxurious pelts sparked a ruthless hunt that nearly wiped them all out. Hundreds of thousands of otters were taken in Alaska and BC alone during this time period. By 1911, when an international treaty finally offered protection, only one to 2,000 sea otters remained worldwide. Early explorers had come looking for the Northwest Passage, not found it. But while they were here, what they did find was this wealth of sea otters. Captain Cook bought furs from the indigenous people, and then the next year they headed off to China. And when they got to China, they found that these pelts were immensely valuable. Sea otter pelts are amazingly warm. Traders were making big dollars. It was very lucrative. One pelt was the equivalent of one man's pay for a year. What Cook did and subsequent traders was connected the West Coast to a global market. And that market was inexhaustible in terms of demand for fur. It was one of the most historic, wasteful hunts that you can imagine. Because nine out of ten sea otters were never recovered. They would shoot the sea otters, and nine out of ten would sink and disappear. One out of ten was taken back and sold for great money in Europe. The result was that sea otters were reduced almost to extinction. The animals, of course, survived in other parts of the coast, Alaska, California, but were virtually wiped out here on the BC coast. The last Canadian sea otter was spotted and killed near Vancouver Island in 1929. But why do sea otters matter? It turns out these playful creatures are a keystone species, meaning their presence has an outsized impact on their environment. Sea otters are voracious eaters, consuming up to 25% of their body weight each day in shellfish and other invertebrates. Found around sheltered islands, reefs, fjords, and bays, sea otters eat a wide variety of seafood, including clams, mussels, crabs, and sea urchins. It's not uncommon for sea otters to float around in the water on their back with their food on their belly, like a picnic spread on a table. And remarkably, they're one of the only animals in the world to use tools like we do, using rocks and other objects to crack open their hard-shelled food to get at the yummy stuff inside. They keep populations of sea urchins and other grazers in check. Without sea otters, urchins can multiply and devour entire kelp forests, creating underwater wastelands known as urchin barrens. When otters return, they allow the lush kelp to flourish again, providing vital habitat and food for a wide array of marine life. This is what's known as a sea urchin barren created when the urchin population explodes. Without otters to control them, urchins devoured once huge kelp forests. But now, with otters returning, scuba divers are seeing the kelp come back. So before we talk about the reintroduction of the sea otter in British Columbia, 
I just want to let you all know that we're on the road to 2,000 subscribers now after all of your support on the last video. And it would mean a lot if you could hit that subscribe button, if you're enjoying the video, and if you want to learn more about important environmental stories every single week and how to make an impact in your local area. Now let's get back to learning all about sea otters. So in the late 1960s, biologists launch a bold plan to bring back sea otters to British Columbia. From 1969 to 1972, 89 otters captured in Alaska were released off the coast of Vancouver Island in Chaklisset Bay. It was a rocky start for the transplants, with the population initially dropping to 70. But then something remarkable happened. The otters began to thrive and expand their range. A survey in 2017 counted over 6,500 sea otters along the BC coast, which is a promising sign of recovery. Today, there's more than 8,000 otters and they occupy a significant proportion of their historic range in British Columbia. 50 years ago, Canadian biologists traveled to Alaska to capture and relocate enough otters to resurrect them on the BC coast. It turned out to be a giant experiment on the entire West Coast ecosystem. In 1970, a Coast Guard ship was converted to transport a large number of otters to the west coast of Vancouver Island. Sea otters were released in British Columbian waters. This may not have been home, but home was never like this. As a result, while sea otters are listed as an endangered species worldwide, the Canadian population has actually been downgraded to a species of special concern, which is an amazing achievement. So the ecological effects of the sea otter return have been dramatic. Sea otters are unusual just because they have such a huge appetite and the change is, is so immediate and, and so direct. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's night and day. Vancouver Island University professor emeritus Jane Watson has been studying sea otters for more than 30 years and was one of the first to document their profound impact. No one was expecting it. When sea otters were reintroduced, no one knew that, that they were going to change ecosystems. In Chaklisset Bay Ecological Reserve, established to protect the reintroduced animals, kelp forests have rebounded, growing 20-fold in the area. And kelp forests are often called the rainforest of the sea, and for good reason. These towering undersea jungles are among the most productive ecosystems on Earth, providing food, shelter, and nursery grounds for an amazing array of marine life. But kelp is more than just a haven for biodiversity. It's also a powerful weapon against climate change. Like terrestrial forests, kelp absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and stores it on the seafloor sediments, helping to buffer the impacts of our greenhouse gas release. In this way, the fate of the sea otter and the fight against climate change are inextricably linked. So to protect the reintroduced sea otter population, British Columbia has implemented a range of management and research initiatives. In 1981, the Chaklisset Bay Ecological Reserve was established to safeguard the otters and their habitat. Fisheries closures on key shellfish species have been put in place to reduce competition with human harvesters. Regular population surveys and research studies are conducted by government agencies to monitor the otter's recovery and their impacts on the ecosystem. Status reports and management plans are being developed to guide conservation efforts. However, these measures have not been without controversy. Some coastal First Nations communities who have long relied on shellfish harvests feel that their needs and traditional practices have not been adequately considered in the rush to protect the otters. Balancing the recovery of this keystone species with the well-being of those indigenous communities that share its habitat remains an ongoing challenge. Sea otters eat shellfish um, and because they eat urchins, urchins eat kelp. If you're an organism that depends on kelp, that's a good thing. If, however, you're a human being who harvests sea urchins or harvests gooey ducks or wants to dig clams in the intertidal, you're going to compete with an otter. So your perception of what an otter is doing might not be quite as good as, as someone who enjoys seeing kelp. So it's not a matter of good or bad, they just they, they have an essential role in that ecosystem. And before we discuss the impact to Indigenous peoples, I just want to highlight the Coastal Voices Project. 
Coastal Voices is a diverse group of Indigenous leaders, knowledge holders, scientists, and artists from British Columbia and Alaska who are working together, discussing, and planning for the profound changes triggered by the return of sea otters. And some of the footage you're about to see here is the result of that amazing project. If you want to check out Coastal Voices, check the pinned comment or the link in the description below. Special animals that only chiefs and their hunters were permitted to take. They were very prized in terms of uh, the pelts. Only hot wear or people of high standing were ever, ever, ever had them. We come, we come from the the um, ocean. That's what our our ancestors um, came out of the ocean, and so our food, our primary food, is of the ocean. When the, to the government, they're just uh, an animal. You know? To us, they mean something. For coastal First Nations who have harvested shellfish for generations, the sea otter's return is a complicated issue. The initial reintroduction happened without adequate consultation, and now these communities are grappling with greatly reduced access to traditional foods. We had big slam beach in Cayuga Duxtis. There was a, a slam beach that there was. 98-year-old Cayucat elder Hilda Hansen saw otters decimate clams, urchins, and other foods inside her community's traditional territory, something documented in a Simon Fraser University research project. All what we eat was taken away by the cocoa herbs. Growing up with grandparents and uh, the traditional foods that were so abundant and not knowing that one day how precious that would that memory would become because today we we don't have any anything nowhere near as many traditional foods some are frustrated that sea otters seem to have more rights than they do there are also concerns about impacts on valuable fisheries and the lack of first nations inclusion in management decisions researchers like those associated with the coastal voices project are working collaboratively with Indigenous communities to navigate this new reality. I think it's important that uh, we combine traditional knowledge and uh, scientific knowledge, um, both uh, accommodate one another, and I believe that's useful. We should have had a choice of those otters being um, brought to our territory because that was too many and they they produce so fast, so, so they're eating more than what my own little family would eat. Potential solutions include renewed traditional otter hunting rights, clam garden restoration, and a more holistic approach to management that values both the benefits and costs of sea otter recovery. I believe that sea, the sea otter has a place in our environment. They play a role where kelp forests are growing. Um, we know that without the sea otter, uh, kelp forests would be overtaken by sea urchins. But we have to learn how to maintain that balance. The story of sea otters in British Columbia is still unfolding. These remarkable creatures have demonstrated their resilience. But the road to recovery isn't always smooth. By working together to promote both ecological and social resilience, we can help chart a course towards a future where otters and human communities that share the shores can thrive. With the right balance of respect, communication, and adaptive management, the return of the sea otter can be an opportunity to heal both our coastal ecosystems and our relationships with the natural world. The kelp forests are regrowing, but a deeper understanding must grow alongside them. So what can you do to support both sea otters and coastal communities? Start by learning about indigenous rights and management practices that allowed humans and otters to coexist sustainably for thousands of years. I would encourage everyone to visit the Coastal Voices website linked in the description to learn more from the First Nations communities directly impacted by the revival of the sea otter population. 
And by doing this, you can begin to advocate for collaborative conservation that empowers local communities. Additionally, if you want to support sea otter populations in Canada, you can look into initiatives like the World Wildlife Fund's Adopt a Sea Otter campaign, where each purchase of a plushie like this contributes to protecting sea otter habitats. I hope you all enjoyed the video and learned a little bit more about the sea otter story here in Canada. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.